Now, past is divided into prehistory, protohistory, and history. Now, I understand it. You might, you know, find it very complex to understand the difference between prehistory or history, or exactly why do we have protohistory stuck in the middle? A lot of people do uh, mail me, message me, DM me, and ask me the difference between history and prehistory, and why should we even call a time frame, a time span, a uh, a prehistoric uh, period what is the need of calling something prehistory why should we people think that by calling it prehistory we are actually demeaning it or bringing it uh, outside the realm of uh, history itself uh, or we are trying to say that whatever that time period falls into prehistory is not actually history but that's not true the reason why we call a certain time period prehistory is because there is non-availability of any written records uh, that has nothing to do with the communication or lack of communication or anything like that but it has to do with the fact that perhaps during this particular period of time the, there was no need of writing uh, or leave any written records. There was absolutely no availability of any written records. And our past in that particular time period is decoded with the help of various artifacts, be it the stone tools of Paleolithic or Old Stone Age, or be it the pottery that starts appearing during the ceramic phase of Neolithic. So it depends on what site we are excavating, what exact time uh, period that we are excavating. And while we're talking about prehistory, it worth mentioning that prehistory, in fact, is one of the longest, uh, uh, you know, spread uh, across a wide time spray, uh, uh, span as compared to history or even proto-history for that matter. So prehistory is the longest period of our past, is actually what covers, uh, you know, our entire, about 80% of our uh, past, our collective past is prehistory. And following prehistory comes proto-history, which is actually the period where you have written records, you do find evidence of writing, but you are unable to decipher that writing. And I'm talking about the Harappan script. We do find Harappan script available to us from 3rd millennium BCE onwards, uh, all the way to the 1st millennium BCE but we do not uh, sorry second millennium BCE but we do not we have not deciphered the uh, Harappan script so far we don't know what it means what the uh, the script is actually trying to tell us therefore we have put that particular period into this sandwich phase called as proto history and then comes history now history is not what generic in generic terms history means history uh, for a layman means history uh, that is past the story of man but actually a past actually uh, comprises of prehistory proto as well as history now history in art uh, you know in the more academic framework means the time period from where we start finding written records so before the presence of written records it's all archaeological data that becomes the primary uh, source of information and from the time we start finding written records onwards it's archaeology plus written records plus other various tools that are available to us to understand the past so history basically starts with the availability of written records and from uh, not only that but also deciphered written records as well so you have example of ashokan edicts and various other uh, written records, be it the Buddhist literature or any form of written records that are available to us falls under the period of history. So our past is basically divided into three parts to, to make things more simple for us when we are uh, interacting with each other and we are also talking to each other. So to, uh, the reason why I'm telling you this is because we are actually will be discussing in today's column about the period of prehistory which is very crucial. It is not only crucial in, uh, you know, in academia, it's not only crucial in archaeological research, but it's crucial in understanding the development of human culture. It is crucial in understanding the needs of man and how the needs of humans have changed over the period of time. What we are going to be talking about is a particular site in Gujarat, in northern Gujarat uh, in particular, which uh, was a prehistoric site but was dated in a, you know, to a time period which 
in where in other areas of our country in subcontinent there were a neolithic onset of neolithic period which is early farming as well so in today's column i'll be discussing about uh, how history our past is actually not linear uh, when i say prehistory protohistory history it not necessarily means that they are always following uh, you know one after the other they are placed in a linear fashion but what it actually means when you look at from a very microscopic uh, perspective we when we zoom in to various eras ecology we try and understand and we do get an uh, you know uh, uh, understanding of the fact that archaeologically these cultures overlapped and it shows that different uh, societies existed and coexisted with each other and in this case you have hunter gatherers coexisting with early food farmers and also coexisting with early harappans hello my name is disha aluwalia i'm an archaeologist and i write regular columns in archaeology at the print you can find my columns uh, in the link given in the description box below and in this week's column as i mentioned we're going to be discussing about a very very important and interesting topic Now, Langraj is a site which is in northern Gujarat. It's a, it's on the banks of Sab Sabarmati River. Uh, the very first uh, stone artifacts or stone tools were found in this area was reported by uh, Robert Bruce Foot. Robert Bruce Foot is considered to be the father of Indian prehistory because, as a British geologist, when he got appointed to Geological Survey of India in 1800s, he uh, identified stone tools. Uh, you know, and it's very difficult to identify stone tools from uh, assemblage of various uh, stone flakes, which could be, which are naturally occurring or naturally, uh, you know, fractured stones. But to understand a tool made out of human hand and human intelligence and a lot of skill and technology that goes into manufacturing this tool was for the first time, uh, you know, put forth by uh, in in Indian context was. Put Forth by Robert Bruce Foot, and he uh, his first hand axe was discovered in uh, Palavaram, which is in Tamil Nadu, and then he surveyed various parts of the country, including Gujarat, where he reported various artifacts, including at the sites of Langnaj. Uh, now, go to 1940s. Uh, late 1940s, when uh, pioneering archaeologist of that time, H. T. Sankalya, and his team members who were uh, equally uh, skilled and efficient in their work, they started surveying the area and they undertook three consecutive surveys of Gujarat of this region. Uh, you know, uh, in three consecutive years, and they found various sites, uh, prehistoric sites uh, in that region. And now here is. what i'm going to be explaining in depth about prehistory in general now prehistory in itself is also further divided like we have even the history been divided to different time eras different dynasties coming and going and different periods prehistory also is divided into the old stone age which is paleolithic period which lays the foundation of prehistoric uh, time in in the subcontinent and also globally uh, the old stone age is characterized by big bulky stone tools then followed by uh, the mesolithic a uh, period which is the period where the transition is happening in terms of subsistence pattern or uh, due to various climatic changes happening uh, because of the uh, because the ice age has ended uh, by this time and this also uh, 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 you know indicate to the onset of holocene period which comes after the ice age has ended now holocene is sort of dated to about 10000 bc uh, and then comes the neolithic period as the name suggests it means a new stone age so uh, it is uh, the time period where animals and also the uh, you know uh, agriculture or food Uh, was domesticated by humans uh, people started opting for more sedentary way of life and agriculture agropastoralism became an important part of economic various economies of various settlements in various regions of the country 
But here is the catch. Now, although we know that Indian subcontinent, one of the earliest date of Palaitic comes from a site called Pat Palavaram, uh, which is a very important site uh, in Tamil Nadu, which is dated to about 1.5, 1.7 million years ago. As you move forward in time and you reach to, uh, to a Mesolithic, a year you need to understand that Mesolithic and its characteristics vary from region to region but one thing remain uh, sort of common everywhere is the stone tools here you start finding more microliths now microliths as i've mentioned that during paleolithic period there are more stone tools bigger bulky stone tools and by the time uh, you know you've reached the period of mesolithic about 10,000 bce and even before that actually the stone tools of started to become smaller and smaller and they become micro in size which means that they are more uh, smaller they are not bulky they are lightweight and also efficient for hunting uh, specifically so a uh, mesolithic is synonymous to microlithic culture so in various literature you may not find the term mesolithic appearing but you will find the term microlithic appearing again and again so microliths continue actually in fact even well uh, into the harappan period and beyond where you do find rory church blades and other microliths uh, uh, you know present but during mesolithic period uh, right from the upper paleolithic to mesolithic period the microliths become a major part of the stool uh, stone tool uh, assemblage so they are the main uh, they form the majority of it as you go into neolithic the stone uh, tool assemblage the tool technology changes so that's why we do have a difference between we can differentiate between the old stone age mesolithic and neolithic similar to what we can do with pottery as well so a uh, mesolithic or microliths were present and various sites by H.D. Sankale and his team were reported and one of those sites were Langnach which uh, Robert Bruce Foote had already reported uh, in 1800s. Now when uh, Dr. Sankalya and others started excavating Langnach they found a large number of animal bones, uh, wild animal bones specifically not domesticated which is an important marker because you know big, when you are uh, doing hunting you are of course hunting the wild game and you uh, the absence of any domestic uh, uh, breed or rare presence of any domestic animal suggests that they have not uh, gone well into the people of Langnaj have not adopted domestication of animals yet so uh, the animals that were found the bones that were found included rhinoceros which is very important because if you look at the present habitat of rhinoceros Gujarat is not one of it uh, so it's very interesting to understand and to even imagine the rhinoceros back when you know people of Langnaj the hunter-gatherers of Langnaj were living in that area rhinoceros was part of the ecology and a shoulder blade was found at Langnaj. It also included a uh, hawk, uh, dog, deer, spotted deer, uh, buffalo, wild buffalo and various other animal uh, species were found uh, at Langnaj. Along with this, uh, human barrels were also found and which is very interesting, this supposedly is one of those rare examples of having human burials uh, in the microlithic time period. Along with that, what was interesting in Langnaj was they also found some coarser variety of pottery. So now the moment, you know, uh, our stratigraphy back in 1940s, if you look at it, you know, you know, if you try and understand the time period that this excavation was happening and this research was being undertaken, you will understand that um, scientific uh, intervention or scientific adaptation within archaeological investigation was very limited at that point. Unfortunately, when this was excursion was going on, C14 was barely been discovered. So there was no other mode of dating, scientifically dating a site, but to have a relative dating of the site on the basis of the stratigraphy, which was established by various uh, researchers over the researchers over the period of time. So uh, when archaeologists found pottery, they were quite perplexed because here they were finding a lot of you know hunting uh, hunted animals. They were finding a lot of wild species, they were finding a lot of microliths and along with that having a pottery meant that you know uh, they are a uh, part of a 
uh, the you know the period where pottery starts to appear that is the neolithic ceramic phase so the confusion remained and uh, archaeologists were not able to uh, date the site well but however they did date the site to about 5000 bce suggesting that this perhaps is a site which uh, uh, which sort of narrates the story of how a uh, hunting gathering economy merged well with the early food producing so this is the time period where there's emergence overlap is happening later on B. Subha Rao another eminent archaeologist also undertook excavation and after that uh, others have also but these major excavations have sort of left an important uh, piece of data and evidence for us to understand that even well within the prehistoric period uh, the the uh, the cultures were not linearly placed and the way they have tried to understand was when various other sites around Langnaj were also being excavated. So you have site of Loteshwar where you do find megaliths, you have Rakpur where also you do find, uh, you know, sorry, microliths, not megaliths, I want to correct myself, uh, at Loteshwar, uh, Rangpur and various other sites you do find microliths at the lowest level and after that you have the agro-pastoralist or the early food producing uh, cultures somewhere, childlithic or uh, elsewhere, uh, you know the Harappan culture starts to appear which suggests that at Langnach which is strictly a hunting gathering, uh, ik, uh, you know society, a uh, hunter settlement, he, they were living along with people of early food producers, uh, people who were indulging into uh, various other forms of subsistence other than just hunting. They were also adopting uh, agro-pastoralism. They were also adopting production on an early stage. And also this was a time period where Harappa and Mojdaro and also at sites like Golavira and also Rakhigadi, these sites were, you know, starting to uh, adapt or starting to develop these early Harappan traits uh, as well because if we go by the chronology from Harappa, uh, we understand that this is a period of Ravi phase at Harappa which is uh, after which you start finding early Harappan period and then you have major Harappan at 3rd millennium BCE. So it is very interesting to understand that, uh, you know, we always believe that it was we were earlier hunter gatherers and then we suddenly switched to um you know sedentary life agriculture but that switch happened slowly that happened uh, gradually and that broke the linearity of our history uh, which suggests that people coexisted shared time and space shared uh, subsistence resources and and also interacted uh, with each other as evident by the presence of that pottery at Langnaj. They were interacting with people who were using pottery in the neighborhood uh, in the neighborhood and it's very interesting to understand it's similar to how we live even today. We uh, coexist with our uh, ruler uh, settlements, we coexist with tribal settlements as well. So coexistence is always the key and we have over the period of time sort of forgotten it. Uh, and site of Langnaj and various other sites that were excavated uh, afterwards also point to this very fact. And it's very interesting also because the site of uh, the, the Gujarat region itself is quite interesting in terms of prehistory. So this is exactly what a site of Langnaj and various other sites that were excavated around Langnaj uh, in northern Gujarat and various other sites were excavated are telling us that you know people have coexisted, they have lived alongside each other which do, does not mean that one is superior than the other and one is primitive. It means that that is what the mode of adaptation and subsistence one has chosen to follow and not uh, the other aspect. It also basically points out uh, uh, within the e ecology of Gujarat, the present day state of Gujarat, the political state of Gujarat, how cultures have developed, evolved in that region because Gujarat in itself is ecologically very diverse. It's divided into Saurashtra, you have Kashi, you have Northern Gujarat. Each region have their own subsistence pattern owing to their resources and their uh, cultural aspects also vary, uh, you know, uh, 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 from region to region. So it's very interesting to understand that within that re region, which unlike Punjab and Haryana did not dwell or unlike uh, the side of America did not go uh, into rushing into the early farming aspect that early on and actually did not 
uh, but did go in uh, into trading and did go into you know produce one of the finest crafts and other skill sets and produced cotton produced shell objects produced uh, so many other uh, things apart from just agriculture goods so it sort of narrates the story of uh, of the people also who were living and residing in that area i hope you like the story and you can read the story in depth in my uh, column which was published the link will be in the description box below uh, do share your comments uh, like this video if you like such contents um if you want more contents follow the print and the youtube channel and also follow them on various social media platform till next week uh thank you for watching and have a nice day